Mickey Live and welcome to this flash training program. Throughout this program, we're going to start with the basics and then move on. By the end, you'll have a completed project all created in Flash. The thing that's neat about this program is that at the bottom of the screen, there's an icon that indicates which section you're working on. If you need to go back, you can scroll through, remembering the icons at the bottom of the screen. Also, the files that we're working on today, you'll find them on our website at macromedia.com. So with that said, let's get started. In this section, we're going to take a look at the basics. We'll start with the SWF file format and its benefits. From there, we'll move to the toolbar. Then from there, we're going to move on to the timeline, adding keyframes and removing keyframes. From there, the library, how to insert and create symbols. This is the basics that we'll need to create our Flash project. Let's get familiar with the Flash tool set. The first two tools on the top are your selection tools. The arrow tool will be how you select an object. The lasso is going to allow you to drag around and make that a selection. But currently, inside of our movie area, that's the white area that you see here, we have nothing on screen. So we must create something. So let's start with the, the line tool. Select the line tool. Now when you select the tool, notice the tool palette. It automatically mod modifies itself to be the properties of the line tool. The first one would be the color well. How do you create the color or choose a color? In this case, we'll just go ahead and choose a blue. Here would be the stroke weight or how thick the line is going to be. And I'll choose four point. And then you have the style. And I'll draw a few lines out on screen. That would be a solid line. We could also do a dashed line. And we could do a dotted line as well. So changing the color, just choose a different color in the palette and just come around and you can see you can draw out just like so. We could say up the weight and go to a solid line. And you'll see now that I have a four point stroke. Now that we have something on screen, let's go ahead and do a little selecting. I want to do some selecting, so I'm just going to drag across all of these graphics so that they're selected, and then hit the delete key so that we can start out on a fresh screen. Text tool, pretty easy to understand, pretty common. We can choose the font. We can also choose the weight, as well as the color that we want. There's that color well again. Whether the text is bold or italic, that's what the I stands for, and also its alignment, center inside the field. And we also have some additional paragraph properties, like margins, indent, line spacing. And I'm going to say cancel for the time being. Let's go ahead and do a little typing. And I'm going to type in my name. Mickey Live it is. You notice inside of the text box, the very top, is this rounded corner. This means that basically the text box is going to grow as we keep adding text to the field. We also could limit the size of the text field by simply dragging the corner out. And you're going to see now that the circle becomes a square to indicate that we have limited the size of the text field so that Mickey Live, the words, the letters VE, automatically move to the bottom. Pretty simple. At the bottom here is an icon that will allow you to make editable text fields. But at this point, we're not going to worry about that. We'll get into that in a later section called How to Create Forms. Let's go ahead and delete this text, though. So we have that deleted. Now I'm going to choose my circle tool, draw an ellipse. Now you notice that here's that color well again. The new thing in the color well is this checkbox at the very top. This would allow you to toggle on and off the stroke color. So if you didn't want a stroke color, X would be in the box. So we're going to go ahead and choose red as my stroke color. I'll choose the weight. There's the thickness of the line and the style. I'll choose solid. And here's fill palette. Once again, you can turn off the fill. That would be the X in the box in the upper left-hand corner of the palette. We're going to choose a gradient this time, and I'm going to draw a circle out. So here's my first circle. Now I can draw an oval. Notice when I draw, if I'm drawing a perfect circle, you'll see a bold circle next to the crosshair on the screen. You also can force it to be a perfect circle, and you do that by holding down on the Shift key. That basically constrains the circle so that it would be a perfect circle. So now we have a circle with a gradient, a field gradient, radial gradient inside the circle. I'll do a select all and delete. Now we're going to draw a few boxes. Let's draw some boxes on screen. S same controls here. Set the stroke, stroke color. Maybe this time we want to say a stroke color of, we'll say none. We'll also set weight. Doesn't matter because we have no stroke. And the style doesn't matter either. All we have is a fill palette, fill color. And I'm going to turn on to purple. Also notice this little box down here in the bottom. This would allow us to set a precise corner radius for a rounded corner box. So I'm going to say, make this 
corner radius of 30 and say OK. Now as I draw, you see that my box has a corner radius that is rounded. If I draw again, I'm going to get the same corner radius. Now I could click here and set this back to 0. But the shortcut for this would be to simply hold down the, sh the Shift key and then click one time on this box, and that would reset it to 0. The other shortcut to getting rounded corners once you started drawing with a square cornered rectangle is to simply use the arrow keys on your keyboard. The down arrow is going to increase the corner radius, and the up arrow is going to decrease the corner radius as you draw. Once you release, you'll see that that is the corner radius. When you draw the third time, you're going to see that it's going to match the same corner radius of the previous rectangle that you just drew. To remove that, remember, just hold down the Shift key, click one time to reset that back to zero. So that's a little bit about rectangles. If you'd like, go ahead and stop and try this yourself. Now we're going to move on to the pencil tool. The pencil tool, I love it because it has these modes. It has the straighten mode. If I start with the straighten mode and I can choose my color again, the weight, I'm going to go with a four point stroke. As I draw in the straighten mode, you'll see that my line automatically straightens itself out to be a straight line, even though it was jagged. I also have the smooth line mode. Smooth line is very unique because even though it's jagged, when I release, it's smooth. I'll point out another feature, and that is when you choose the selection tool, you can also select your line, and I'm going to select the smoothed line, and I can select the smooth function. So it incrementally will smooth my line out. The more I click, the smoother it becomes. Now I'm going to go ahead and select all of that and hit the delete key. Now I'm going to use the paintbrush. Now I like the paintbrush because of the paint mode. Now I'm going to choose to paint normal first, which basically means it's going to paint over top of whatever's on the screen. And I'm going to do a little painting with purple. It's not beautiful, but this is, will be good. I can select the color. I can also select the brush size. So I'm going to go down to a smaller brush size for the, my next stroke, and also the style. Maybe I want to go with a square brush. Now with a square brush, I can choose a mode of paint behind. I'm going to choose paint behind mode. What this allows me to do is Wherever I start drawing, and I better change my color so we can see this, I'm going to change it to blue. Wherever we start drawing, I'm actually not painting over this purple area. I'm painting behind it. So you see, if you have problems coloring inside of the lines, this is perfect because you see the blue lines are now on the outside. The other modes that we have here are paint selection. I'll use my lasso tool to create a selection, and I'll just draw around. There's my selection. Now I'm going to choose my paintbrush tool. Make sure it's set to paint selection. And I'll up my brush size. Still using the square brush and choosing a new color. I'm going to go with green. Now I can paint anywhere, way out over here. And anywhere inside of that selected area, when we show it, you'll see that's the only area that has been painted is inside of that selected area. Now paint inside, this is rather unique because it knows whichever area I start painting in. And this time I'm going to go with a pink color which means that if I start painting inside of this green, it's only going to paint inside of that green area. So when I release, you'll see it's only inside of what area was green. Now if I choose to paint inside of the blue, all I have to do is click down. It intuitively knows that that is the inside or painting inside of the blue area. The other mode that we didn't talk about was known as the paint fill only. So basically, if I apply a stroke, and I'm going to skip down to the next tool, which is going to be the inkwell, this would allow me to apply a stroke to any shape or object. I can also change the weight color here as well. But now that I have a stroke applied, I'm going to go back to my paintbrush tool and choose to paint fills. So what you'll see is I'm going to use this pink color once again over the top of this purple area. Now even though I've painted, it's only filled in the purple area and hasn't removed the lines. Because if I chose normal mode and I started painting, you would see now that the lines are removed, the purple is removed as well as the lines. So paint fill only allows us to change the fill and not the stroke, just like so. Now we're going to move on. Inkwell, we just experienced, that allows us to change color. The paint bucket. The paint bucket is neat because this will allow me to dump color. I can choose a new color and dump the color into a certain area, just like so. Now I'm not really excited about this, so I'm going to go ahead and delete this. And let's talk about a principle that's very different than any other vector-based drawing tool. And that is, if we were to go ahead and draw out a square, 
I'm going to draw out one square. That, and I want to draw out the stroke rather than the fill. So we'll turn that off. We'll set this fill to be bold, black. As inside of any other drawing tool, what happens is what you draw defines the object. And inside of Flash, what you see defines the object, which means that I currently see this line on the bottom. That means that this is an object. Now, if I want to select the entire object, all I have to do is double click on the line. That would select the entire object. And in this case, I'm going to do a little dragging and then hold down on my Option key to create a duplicate. So now I have two boxes. The difference here is now each one of these individual sections is an object that can be in individually colored or we can apply a fill to. So I could type in a fill here and a fill here and a fill here as well. Now if I take my line tool and I'm just going to start from the very top and draw it along, look at it snaps to the corner. Now you see I now have this line which is its own object and each one of these individual shapes are its own object. So if I decide to fill in this color I could do put in a lighter blue. Now in no other drawing tool where you have three points coming together, they all become one. But when you have nothing selected in Flash, if you go select the corner, you're going to be able to pull that corner. You notice that all three corners now move as one, even though each one of the individual sections is its own object, which is very neat. I also want to show you one last thing, and that is, I'll leave this up for a second, and that is with the paint bucket tool, I can dump in a gradient. I'm going to choose a gradient color. Now, if I choose a gradient color and then choose lock, what this allows me to do is to share the center point of the last gradient that I dumped in, or in this case would be the first gradient. Now that's sharing the center point. Now I know you think they're all three separate objects, but we have the ability with the paint bucket tool to transform the fill color, transform the gradient. That's transform gradient object right there. Once that's selected, we can click on a gradient, and you see there's the center point. And even though they're three separate objects, they still act independently. Now, if I wanted this square to have its own gradient, all I have to do is choose a paint bucket tool and just apply its own separate gradient without the lock function turned on. The reason I've shown you to this is because when you go to the eyedropper tool, you can sample a color, and by default, it locks the center point of whatever gradient you have selected. And that would allow you to apply a new gradient or sample that gradient and put it into the area. Now I'm going to move one more tool down. The erase tool, very common tool. With the exception of the erase modes, just like the paintbrush tool, you have the erase modes. You can paint, erase the fill. So I'm going to do a little erasing the fill. You see the stroke is still there. We also could erase the lines. So if I erase the lines, you're going to see now I've erased the lines and not the fill. Choose another mode. Erase selection, if we had an area selected with our lasso tool, we can now erase in this area. So we choose the erase tool and just draw around like so, just like that. And maybe we want to erase inside. So whichever object we have selected first, that is going to be defined as the inside area. Notice we're only selecting or erasing in this object. Now, this is an interesting tool, the faucet. This allows you to basically dump or erase objects. Now, I very rarely use a faucet because normally I just use the arrow tool and select the area and then hit the delete key. Now, we're moving to the last two tools on the tool palette, and these are the hand tool. This is going to allow you to grab and scroll the screen, as well as the magnify lens that's going to allow you to zoom in. Holding on the option key will get you zoom out. Now, I very rarely use these tools in the tool palette. More often, I use the shortcut key because I just want to not have to go down and select those tools. And the way to get to the grab to hand is simply by putting your finger on the space bar. This will allow you to scroll this around screen. And to zoom in, you would hold down on the control space bar on PC, command space bar on the Mac, and that will get you to zoom in. Now, if you extend your finger from command space bar and then put your finger on the alt key on the PC or option on the Mac, that will turn the zoom in tool into zoom out. So this is pretty much a preview of the drawing tools inside of Flash. We'll be using them throughout the day, and I'll point out some additional tips as we continue on. Now let's move to the timeline. Up to this point, things probably seem pretty familiar with any drawing tool that you're currently using. But really what sets Flash apart is a timeline, because it allows us to add interactivity and animation. What I've got is scene one. You can have as many scenes as you want layer one, and one blank keyframe. This is the way every Flash movie will start. Also notice that you have a red line. This is known as the playhead. 
underneath the playhead is a blank keyframe because nothing has been drawn inside of the movie area. So what I'd like to do is go ahead and draw something. So I'm going to draw out just a little red ball. So I have a red ball. Now you notice that the blank keyframe, because we have something drawn on screen, has become solid. This is known as a keyframe. A keyframe is known as a point of change. It also tells the playhead what to display. So I'm going to insert some frames up to frame 20. We'll go out to frame 20 and select frame 20 and choose Insert Frame, F5. Now notice, because we have something in frame 1, it tells the playhead to display what's in frame 1 all through our 20 frames. Now if we want something displayed different, we have to insert a keyframe because that's known as a point of change. So I'm going to insert a keyframe in frame 10. I'll choose Insert, Keyframe. This is a point of change. However, we haven't moved the ball at this time. So that means that even though we've inserted a keyframe, we have not introduced a point of change. What we'll do is select frame 10, double click on our ball, and move it across screen. Now you'll see that as we scrub the playhead, it's going to stay constant in what's been displayed in frame 1 all the way until it hits frame 10, which is our point of change, our new keyframe all the way through frame 20. If we want to introduce a second point of change, all we have to do is insert another keyframe, F6 being the shortcut key, or under the Insert drop-down menu, Insert Keyframe. And now we can introduce another change, and you'll see that now our ball bounces around on screen. Let's take a look at some of the icons on the lower section of the timeline. First of all, onion skinning. You can turn onion skinning on. You'll see some brackets at the very top of the timeline. This is how you increase or decrease the number of frames that you are going to onion skin. The reason you would use onion skinning is if you were going to do a frame by frame animation. This way you could see all the other keyframes inside of your timeline, or at least the keyframes that you have bracketed. And move whichever keyframe you selected to its new position relative to the other keyframes that you see ghosted out on screen. There are actually two onion skinning modes. There's onion skinning, which is kind of the ghosted out mode, and then there's a key line mode of onion skinning, or outline mode. That way you just see the outline and not the ghosting out of the other frames. Now the next icon over, I call this the most dangerous icon in Flash, because this allows you to do what's known as a multiple frame edit, which means at this point, whenever these brackets are up, we can actually do a select all. Under edit, we'll choose select all, and this would allow us to move all of these individual items. Now we're moving all the items on each keyframe, which means now when we turn this off, we turn outline off, you're going to see that we've actually modified each frame inside of our movie. So be sure you're only turning onion skinning or multiple frame edit on when you intend to do a multiple frame edit. If at any point you see the brackets on the top of the timeline, and they're not, you don't, you didn't intend to turn that on, be sure that you check and make sure that you turn it off before you move on. Could get you into a lot of trouble. Lastly, let's take a look at the library. Go into Window and choose Library. Library window will open. This is the place where we store all the elements that we're going to use throughout, of our, throughout our project. That would include graphics, sounds, and even items that we would create inside of Flash. We'll go ahead and draw a ball out on screen. I'd like to make this into an element in our library. Select the ball, choose Insert, Convert to Symbol. Things in our library are called symbols. Once I release, Symbol Properties dialog box. Let's just define the type of symbol that we're going to create, as well as give it a name. Name it Ball. Now we have the ball in our library. We can reuse this symbol over and over again throughout our project. We'll come back to this symbol properties dialog box as well as the library throughout our project. But let's go ahead and get our project started. I'm excited because now we've covered the basics. Now we can move on to creating our Flash project. First of all, we're going to create animation using tweening, using keyframes. Then we'll create some symbols in our library. One of the symbols we'll be creating is a button. We'll learn how to create interactivity with our buttons. The next thing we'll do is we'll work with layers, repositioning layers around. And after that, the final step will be to open a pre-existing Flash movie and share the library across projects. So we'll take from one Flash movie and borrow a symbol in its library and bring it into our movie. 
This will be great. I'm excited. Let's get started. What I'd like to do is get a preview of what we're going to be creating in the section called Let's Begin. If I scrub our playhead, you're going to see the logo down here at the bottom of the screen. It's going to move up to the very top by using tweening. This is a form of animation using two keyframes to create that animation. We'll be doing that first. Then we'll also create some symbols on our library. We'll create the background green navigational bar as well as the buttons that will navigate us at a later point throughout our site. The color bars on the screen and then we'll pull in the background graphics from another flash movie. So let's go ahead and begin on this project. Let's start our project and we're starting from a blank screen. We're going to start in building a site for a fridge fashion company which is a company that basically creates magnets and sells them on the web. Now this is going to be kind of fun because we need to give them a little corporate identity. So let's draw some circles out on screen. Now first of all I'm going to draw a circle and I'm going to take and I will draw out first a tan circle. So let's draw out a tan circle and I'm choosing a tan color from pop down list. Notice my stroke has been set to none and I'm just going to draw that up screen. Holding down the shift key is going to constrain it to make it a perfect circle. Now the next thing that we can do is draw another circle. Let's go out, change the color, and I'm going to go to an olive green color. Once I have the olive green color selected, we're going to draw out our circle a little bit larger than the other previous circle. Now we have two circles. We'll select them both. And we can just use a marquee selection, which is to just drag over top of the two circles. Now I could try to align these two centers, circles center, but that would be a little bit too much work. I'd like to go the easier route, and that is to let the computer do it. So from the pop-up menu, I'm going to choose the Align Palette. Under the Align Palette, here we have Align Vertical, Align Horizontal. And I'm going to set both of those to be center. I'd also like to center it to the page. Just by habit, I do that, and we'll say OK. Now there's the basis for our logo. Fridge Fashion. They will be fashionable, so let's give them some, let's put a couple of text, a little text inside of our logo, choosing times, the size that we want, and also our olive green color. And I'm going to turn on bold and italic, and I'll type out two lowercase f's. There's our two f's. Now with the selection tool, we'll move them to be center with our circle. Also want to scale them so they fill the entire yellow or tan circle that we have. So I'm going to scale those out and then nudge them kind of to center. And I'm using the arrow keys on my keyboard to nudge that center inside of my logo. Now the last step is to make this a symbol in our library. So I'll open the library. You see we don't have anything in there at this point. Just select the logo and choose insert convert to symbol. We'll name this logo and notice that we're going to define it as a graphic and say OK. Now let's do kind of what Flash is well known for and that's create an animation. We'd like to animate the logo from the center point. Actually I'd like to animate it from off screen to a lower uh, position on the upper top of the screen. So let's do that now. So what I'm going to do is first of all move my logo off screen. So we're moving our logo off screen. Now that we have our logo off screen, what I want to do is to go ahead and insert a keyframe. Remember, a keyframe is a point of change. So I'll go, to fr fr I'll go to frame 15 and select the frame and then choose insert keyframe. Keyframe is a point of change. Remember, when we say insert keyframe, we're copying exactly what's in keyframe 1 and our new keyframe, which happens to be keyframe 15. Now we have to introduce a change. So let's move the logo. We're moving the logo, and I'm also going to scale it and make it a little bit smaller on screen, right about in the top middle. Now with that done, if we scrub our playhead, you'll see that it jumps after frame 1 through frame 14, it jumps in frame 15 to its upper position. Now I want to create a little tweening, which is basically to create the frames in between the two keyframes. We'll do that by double clicking on the frame. That's frame 1, we double click. Notice the Frame Properties dialog box open. The tab we want is the Tweening tab. We're going to choose Motion Tweening. We have a little control over the type of motion tweening we're going to do. In this case, we're going to leave it the default and say OK. Now if we hit Play, 
would you know we have tweening. Animation happening on screen. Now I'm going to go back to frame one. We can also modify the two individual keyframes once they've been created. So let's do a little scaling. We'd like it to be a little bit larger. And we'll start it off screen again. And then when we hit play, you'll see that it moves to its upper position. So that's the first step. We have tweening. We've created animation. Now we have to work on our navigation. So let's create the navigational background. To create the navigational background, once again, I'm going to draw on screen. But this time, we're going to add a new layer. So the first step is to name the layer that we have. And I'll think we'll name this logo. Logo it is so that we remember what's on that layer. Now we're going to add a new layer. You have to click right here on the Add New Layer button, which is a little plus sign underneath our logo layer. This is going to be called the nav layer, N-A-V. Notice it automatically inserts the same number of frames all the way out to frame 15. And it also inserts a blank keyframe automatically. And in this keyframe, I'm going to use my olive color again. And I'm going to draw from the center of the screen down and across. There's the first step. The next step would be to go ahead and add this little bump out on the outside of our nav bar. And the way I'm going to do that is to click down on the mouse button, kind of halfway in between. And using the up and down arrow keys on the keyboard, that's how you create a rounded corner, we're going to round the corner of this navigational bar. And because I've chosen the same color, you see what you see is an object inside a flash. So that now has become all one object. And while it's selected, let's make it a symbol in our library. How do we make it a symbol? We simply go under Insert, Convert to Symbol. And now we can name this nav, and we'll choose it to be a graphic symbol. And now we have two symbols in our library, logo and nav. Let's play our timeline. The way we do that is simply hit return on your keyboard. So we're going to hit return on the keyboard. We got a little bit of a problem. And that is that our logo goes behind the navigational bar that we just created. So to modify the layers to switch their positioning, we'd like to have logo on top. You simply select the logo layer and drag it to the top. Now the logo is going to come on top of our navigational bar. Now that we have two symbols on screen, and basically the basis for our navigation, we have to create some buttons. And before, we drew our items on screen and then turned them into symbols. In this case, I want to teach you a new way, and that's to go over to the library and click on the plus sign. This is to add a new symbol. Now the first thing you're going to see is symbol property dialog box. And in this case, we're creating a button. So I'm going to call this button. We'll name it first. Button it is. And I'm going to do a dash. We'll do dash. We'll call this button home. This is going to be our home button. Now I want it to behave as a button. So I'm going to choose the radio button for button and say OK. Now notice there's a new tab on the top of the screen. We have moved into symbol edit mode. Well, which symbol are we editing? We're editing the new symbol we just created called Button Home. Notice the timeline. Because we defined it as a button, the timeline has been customized for the button states. The up state, that's what's displayed when the page is loaded. The over state, that's what will be displayed when we move over the button. The down state, that is the state which is displayed when the mouse button is pressed down. Now the hit state, that's the most confusing state of all. It just defines the area in which our mouse interacts with the button. We never hit, see the hit state outside of symbol edit mode. Only the mouse itself sees it. So when we roll over the hit state, it shows us the over, over state. Then we click down, it shows us the down state. So let's create the up state. First of all, I'd like to draw another circle. And this time, I'd like our circle to have a white fill. We're choosing white from the fill palette. And we're also going to choose a black stroke. And I'd like us to have a heavy stroke. So we're going with a stroke weight of 8, 8 points. And I'm just going to draw out on the center of the screen here. So we're going to draw on the center of the screen. And we're going to draw out a circle. So I've got my circle drawn. has the white fill. I'm going to go ahead and select the entire thing and kind of move it center on the screen. Now I'm going to use my text tool. My text tool, I'm going to use the font change the font style to be something bold. Let's try impact. I'm going to try impact on my list. So I'm going to come up on my list and choose impact. That's the font we're going to use. I'll leave it to 72. And I'm going to set the weight 
to be black. I like it bold, but not italic, so I'll turn that off. Let's go ahead and type in the plus sign. So this is going to be our upstate. It's this little cute button with a plus sign in the middle. Now I'm using the arrow keys to kind of nudge this. I can also select both of those items and remember our line palette, modify, align, and we're going to leave it the same, align center and center, center to the page. Make sure that's turned on at the bottom. So both of our items are now center to the page. Now that's our upstate. We want something new displayed or a new change to be displayed in the overstate. So we must insert a keyframe, point of change. So I'm going to insert a keyframe, choosing the insert keyframe, into the overstate. This is now a new state, a new place of change. We can create something new. And I'm going to go back to using the same fill color and in the overstate, we're just going to roll down and I'm using rounded corners and I'm going to use my arrow keys to increase or decrease the rounded corners. In this case, I would like a fairly rounded corner box and we're just going to round it kind of like so and then release. Now, I don't want a solid white background. What I'd like is to create a custom background. So I'm going to launch my palette and I'm going to create a new color. So to create a new color, we'll just select the color mixer, it's the dot, at the, the icon at the very top of the color palette. With that open, we're allowed to create a new color. I'll select new, and you'll see here that that is the color that I'm working on. I like it to be transparent, so I'm going to set an alpha value. That's a transparency value. and It'll be 50% transparent, so half we can see through, half we can't, and we need to hit the change button. That applies that color our new color into that color that we just created. Now that that's done, we can say OK. Now I'm going to use my paint bucket tool and I'm going to apply that new transparent color. You'll see at the very bottom of the, your list, color mixer, color list, you'll see transparent color. Take my paint bucket and apply it. Now we're on a white background, so we can't really see the transparency value at this time. So we just have to trust that it's there. Now we're going to go to the down state and I'm going to insert another keyframe. So F7. We'll say F7, F7 insert a blank keyframe. In this case, we're going to insert a keyframe F6, which is a new point of change. And at this point, I would like to add, like to add solid white. So we'll go back and apply solid white, choose white from our palette, and that will be our down state. Now here's a little trick that we'll use, and that is I would like the hit area to be the same, to be the same as our plus sign. And that is really the upstate. So what we're going to do is do a contextual menu click, which is a right click on the PC, a control click on the Mac to get contextual menu up, and we will choose copy frames. To get this menu, I did a right click on the upstate. We copied the frame. Now we'll go over to hit state, and we'll choose paste frame. So that means that the area of our button is exactly the same as our upstate. Let's also put some text into our overstate so we know what this is. Let's type in the word home. So we're going to put home, and maybe it's a little bit large, so we'll select that and make our text. We'll go down to 48 and drag this into here. I'm going to copy this, copy our overstate. I chose copy, choose edit, copy. Now in the down state, I'd like to place it in the same position in the down state, our text that we just copied. So I'm going to choose Edit, Paste in Place, which basically remembers the same X and Y position. So what you have is you have the up state, over state, down state, and the hit state. Let's take our movie, our button, out to our main movie. To get back to our main movie out of Edit Symbol Mode, we simply click on Scene 1. Now back in Scene 1, there's our button symbol. Notice graphic symbols have this little square icon with this, the graphic elements in there, square, triangle, and circle. And our button has a little icon with a finger. So what we'll do is we'll take and drag that onto screen. Now, before I drag that onto screen, it may be best to create a new layer. We learned how to do that earlier. That's just to create, click on the plus button, and we're going to type in button. This is our button layers. We'll type, call this buttons and say OK. Our button is looking a little large. Let's do a little scaling. With the arrow tool selected, select the object and turn on scaling and scale this button down. We're going to hold down on the shift key to make sure that that's properly the proper size. And then I'll use the arrow keys just to nudge it in the proper position. Clicking away deselects the button. 
we'd like to have four buttons here, and I'd like to do a little cheating. And that is to copy this button down across the screen. So I'm going to do this. If I start dragging the button, and then the trick is on the PC to hold down on your Alt key, and on the Mac, hold down on the Option key. When you put your finger down, you're going to see a little plus sign come up to your, next to your arrow. That means that you are doing a drag copy. So I have one selected. So there's two buttons now. I'll make three, and then four, my last one. Now if we look at these buttons, they're not all aligned perfectly. I'd like to have the spaces between each of the buttons the same. So I'm going to hold down on the Shift key so I can do a multiple object selection and just Shift select them. Shift key is held down so I get all the buttons selected and we'll choose the Align palette again. The Align palette will save you lots of time. And that is we need to simply choose Align. Now we don't want to align it vertically center. We'd like to align, distribute them evenly spaced. So I'm going to align them center, evenly spaced, and horizontally, we'd like to align them from the outside. And I don't want to align them to the page, so I'm going to turn that off and say OK. So now you see the spaces are all the same. Now with them still selected, I can hold down the Shift key to reselect all four. I can also nudge them all into position so that they're properly spaced in between my navigational bar. Now we have two last steps in this project. And that is, we'd like to add a little color to our screen as well as some text. So I'm going to add, first of all, a text layer. And I would like the text layer, double click on the logo, layer name, to be able to edit it. And we'll call this text. And I would like the text to be welcome. So we'll just type in, in white, choose the color white, welcome. Welcome it is. Now that's looking a little large. So I'm just going to select that. So I just drag over that text to select it. And I'll take the text size down. We'll say to 48. We'll probably do it. And I would like it to be italic. Nice. So I've got my little welcome on my page. The next thing I'd like to do is add a, a couple color bars to create a nice design. So I add yet another layer. And we'll call this color bars. Color bars. So we've got color bars named. Take that effect. And I'm just going to draw out a color bar. Now I'm going to choose no stroke and choose a fill. And I'm going to go with, a, first of all, a light blue color. So we choose a light blue color. And I'm just going to drag that down across screen. Now look at there. I have rounded corners. Not exactly what I wanted. Remember the shortcut key to remove the rounded corners? That's to hold down on the shift key and click once on the rounded corner dialog box. So now that that's held down on the shift key, I now have perfectly square corners. And I'm just going to drag this up top. And maybe it's not perfect. I'd like to do a little scaling. So with that selected, I'm just going to select it, turn on scaling, get the scale handles up so I can pull it very top of the window so that it's perfect. I like it to be perfect. So we got that perfectly created. Now we've got a couple of issues here. We'll fix those. The text is being covered up. But at this time, I just want to do a little option drag so that I can get four bars running across the center. So I'm holding down on the Shift key, actually, to make it move straight across. And then I'm holding down on the Option key on Mac, Alt key on the PC, to do a copy. So I'm going to get three little color bars, or actually four color bars, across my screen here. So I have four color bars. All the same color, not as good. So I'm going to go back to my Paint Bucket tool and just apply some other colors. Uh, maybe I'd like to go with a light green in this case and go ahead and choose maybe a blue. Got blue going for us. Maybe we'll go with a, a darker, maybe more of a purplish color. We can apply the purple color there. And we'll go to a bright green, I guess. So I've got three things. Ooh, lovely. So let's take a look at what we've got. We have three color bars. Now remember the stacking order. I'd like those color bars to fall underneath of my logo. What I'm going to do is adjust the screen so I can see all of my layers. And that's just to drag on the bar in between your work area and the layers. So we'll take and drag color bars like that to be above the nav layer, but underneath the text and underneath the logo. It's looking pretty good right there. And we're almost done with this section. And the next step would simply be to click on the plus button and add one last layer. And this layer we're going to drag to the bottom. And this is going to be our custom artwork that's been created. And we'll call it Kitchen. So this is the Kitchen layer. Now here comes an interesting issue. Where are we going to get the Kitchen graphics? Maybe someone has created it before, 
and we want to reuse it from a previous project. And I'd like to share with you a way to do that. We'd like to pull it in and make the kitchen part of our current library. What we'll choose is choose File Open, and not open the file, but open it as a library. So we're going to use the library of an existing file. The file that we want is going to be called Mickey Live Flash Video. We'll choose Open. Now you notice I have two libraries available to me now. One is the library from Mickey Live Flash Video, and one is the library of our project. Inside the Mickey Live Flash Video file, we have a kitchen symbol. To add that to our main movie, we simply drag it out on screen. And there is our kitchen. Now the kitchen may be a little bit small, so we'll close this window out, position it where we want. I'd like it to have the refrigerator up there, and we'll do a little scaling. So I'm just going to turn on the scale tool. There we go. Perfect. Refrigerator is looking good. Now let's make sure our buttons work. Remember we created that button? Go under Control, say Enable the button. The button is now turned on. When we roll over, look at there's that transparent background, and we have Home in all four positions. At this point, we're basically done with this section. The next section, we'll go on and add interactivity, work with scenes, and a lot more with Flash. So at this point, if you'd like, pause and work through this section, and then we'll pick it up again in a second. We have the basics for our site now created. The next step would be find out how large this is. We want to make sure our file is small, so we'll look at Bandwidth Profiler. From there, we'll move to adding scenes. We want our site to move from one scene to the next so that we can have multiple pages in our site. From there, we'll take a look at the Instance Properties dialog box. And after that, we'll change the movie color so that it matches our design. Let's go ahead and do that now. First things first, let's find out how large our movie is. Under the Control menu, you'll find Test Movie. If you go to Test Movie mode, you're going to be able to see what your final project is going to look like. Our animation comes up at the top. Notice it's looping because we haven't told the playhead to stop at this point. You see here we have our buttons. They all work. But we're going to go under View and choose Bandwidth Profiler. Bandwidth Profiler shows us how large our movie is. Our movie will take approximately 4K to start playing. We see the spike within the first frame. It's approximately, it's going to be about a half a second on a 28.8 modem. Also, you see the red line here. This is known as a streaming line. Anything underneath the streaming line, basically the user does not wait for. In this case, we're just showing these little recipes, telling the logo to move up across the screen. Notice we also have over 15 frames that are being displayed, but everything's downloading really within the first two frames. This is a great start. Let's go back to our main movie, and we're going to work on scenes. Now, when we work on scenes, I've kind of created a movie about understanding scenes that will help us understand the way scenes work. I'm going to go under Window and choose Inspector Scene Inspector. We have the inspector open. Notice that we have scene 1, scene 2, scene 3, 4, and 5 inside of the inspector. Watch what happens when we test this movie out. Go under Control, Test Movie. I'll turn Bandwidth Profiler off for a second. You notice that it automatically plays from one scene to the next without stopping. And that's because Flash automatically plays from one scene to the next unless we've told the playhead to stop. And in this ca case, we haven't. Notice it also plays down the list starting with one and moving through five. If we go back to the scene inspector and rotate or move, we'll say we move five up underneath one, and we'll move four underneath two. So we have one, five, two, four, and three. Now let's go back to our test movie mode. Control, test, movie, see what happens. Notice now we're going 1, 5, 2, 4, 3. Notice it's in the same order that we've seen earlier that we've set up inside of our scene inspector. Starting from the top and playing down. So playing from 1, 5, 2, and 4, and then 3. So Flash automatically plays from one scene to the next unless we tell it to stop. And we define the order in which it plays inside of the scene inspector. Let's go back to our main movie and add some scenes inside of our movie. So go to Window, choose Inspector, and choose Scene Inspector. I'd like to add three additional scenes. So I'm going to say add scene one, two, and three. So we have three scenes. The first one 
This is a scene that we previously created. I've double clicked on it to launch the property inspector for scenes. And I'd like to name this the home scene. This is the scene that we'll be coming back to. The next scene I would like for us to go to is to be called about us. So we'll type in about us. Next scene, we're going to call this email. This is going to be our contact scene. Say OK. Double click on the last one, and we will name this. I'm going to go ahead and name this the store scene. This is going to be a great scene for us. We'll have our form in there. Let's go back to the home scene. But before we go and click on the home scene, let's close the scene inspector. I'd like to show you a shortcut key or shortcut way to get back to the scene inspector, and that's just by clicking on Edit Scene Inspector at the very top of the window. This would allow you to select the scene which you'd like to go back to, in this case, the home scene. Now we have our scene set up, and remember, it's going to play automatically from one scene to the next. If we were to test this movie out, going under Control, Test Movie, you would see that it automatically is going to flash white. Those are our other scenes that are being played in the background. So what we have to do is tell the playhead to stop. So let's go to frame 15, and in frame 15, we are going to actually apply an action. I've put in an action layer inside of my movie. And this is going to be the current layer that we'll be working on. So let's go ahead and add a keyframe. If you haven't added the, frame, the layer action, go ahead and click on the Add Layer to add the action layer. And in frame 15, we're going to add a blank keyframe. So choose from Insert, Blank Keyframe, or an F7 shortcut key. Now you'll see here, this is where we want it to stop, is in frame 15. So I'm going to double click on the frame. This gets me to the Frame Properties dialog box. The first time we chose tweening, this time we're going to choose actions. This is kind of Flash's programming language. Click on the plus button. Notice on my list, I could go to another frame, I could tell the playhead to stop, that's what we're going to choose. But you could also tell it to get a URL, to go and load an HTML page at this point if you want it. And in this case, we'll just choose plain old stop. We're telling the playhead to stop. And all you have to do is say OK. Now look at the frame. You'll see a little tiny A there. That indicates we now have an action applied to the frame. Now that we've done this, let's go ahead and take our buttons. These are going to be our navigational devices that are going to take us from one scene to the next. So we need to modify each one of these buttons. And right now, they're actually the same button. So what we're not going to modify is the instance of the button. The first button we're going to modify and we're going to add an action to the button. You can add an action to a frame as well as a button. In this case, we're going to add an action to the home button. We would like to tell the home button, when someone clicks on it, to actually go to the home scene. So we're going to choose the scene that we want is going to be called home. So we're going to choose home from the scene list. And I don't want to replay the intro. All I want it to do is to go back to frame 15. So I'm going to type in the number of the frame, which is frame 15. We'd like it to go to and stop, which is fine. So I'm not going to select go to and play at the bottom of the window. But there are occasions where you'd like the movie to play when it gets to the new scene. So you turn on go to and play. Now that I have that one done, let's click on the next one. Notice the definition of this button is still the home button. But we can apply a new or different action only modifying the instance, the point at which this button is on screen at this time. You could have one button that goes to 100 different places. The beauty of that is we'd only download this button one time. In this case, we'd like it to go to About Us. That's a scene we'd want. Frame 1, Go To and Stop is OK. We'll quickly do the last two. And we're going to choose Go To is the action that we want. Go To, Scene, the Email Scene, Frame 1, and say OK. Go to the last scene that we want is the store scene, and we're going to go to and stop the first frame of the store scene. So let's test these out. And the way we're going to test these out is just to turn on the button. We'll go under Control, Enable Button, and when we roll over the home scene, that's going to take us to our current frame. So let's go to the next one. Notice it takes us to the Us scene. Coming back, you can test these by just going back to the home scene and clicking on each one of those buttons. So let's go back to the home scene. We'll click on email. That takes us to the email scene. And we can test the store one as well. But at this point, 
what I'd like to do is point out we have a frame action that tells the movie to stop. When we click on the buttons, these automatically go into our next scenes. The problem with these buttons is that they are all the same, meaning they all say home, and we'd like them to be customized for when you click, tell the user where they will be going when they click on the button. So let's customize that. We're going to open the library. I could go through the process of creating all new buttons for each one of those scenes, and I don't want to do that. What I'd like to do is to just simply select my original button, and under the Options palette, choose to duplicate the button. Now, I'm going to do two first so that you can get the idea, and then after that, we'll let you go ahead and do that on your own. I'm going to choose Duplicate, and the next one that we're going to do would be About Us. About Us is the name, and it's going to be a button, so we'll say OK. Notice we now have two buttons. We'll need to edit this button. So let's just go ahead and double click on the button and go to the overstate. We don't want it to say home. We'd like it to say about us. So I will type in about us. Remember, that's also in the downstate. We need to make sure that we correct the downstate as well. So we'll type in about us in the downstate as well. To get back to the main movie timeline, you can just click on the home tab. Now we're back to the main movie timeline. We just need to duplicate this button one more time so that you get the idea. I'm going to choose Duplicate. And we're going to call this one Email. The last one that you will do will be called Store. This one is called Email. So we'll call this Email the Email button. And inside of this Email button, I'm going to double click to launch the button. And in the overstate, once again, I'm going to change the text to be, call this Contact. Contact us contact us, and then we'll go to the down state and do exactly the same. And I'll let you go ahead and do the store button. We'll say contact us. So the last button that you'll create is the store button. Let's go back to the home scene, though, and I'll show you how to fix these buttons up in the timeline. We need to modify the instance of these buttons so that they don't say store. That they say The first one will say about us. The second one would say email or contact us, and the third would say store. That's the one that you'll be creating. I'm going to go and turn off the button. So OK, Control, Disable Buttons. Select the Selection Tool, the Arrow Tool, and select the first button. Double click. Now I want to change the definition. I like the action the way it is. It does exactly what it's supposed to do. So I'm going to come to Definition, and I'm going to choose change to be about us. All you need to do is double click on the button that you want. In this case, it is the about us. The next button that we we'll want is going to be email. And the last button, which you'll do on your own, is to do the store button. So now that we have that set up, I'd like to take this moment to pause. You can go back through and learn each one of the steps that we've mastered at this point. And then we'll come back and add our new buttons and our new background to each one of our new scenes. OK, now that we have our store button created, let's test it and make sure that it works. I'm going to go under Control and make sure that Enabled Buttons is turned on. That way, when we roll over the store button, we're going to be able to see the overstate. There it is and the down state. When you click down and hold, you're able to see that. And when we release, it is going to go to the store scene. Now, the benefit of modifying the instance is we were still able to maintain each one of the button's positions, as well as the action, and their alignment. So we didn't have to redo any of that work. It was a great time saver. Now, the next step for us to do is to go ahead and copy all of this content onto our new scenes. We're going to use it as our, the basis for our scenes. So I'm going to select in frame 15 and scroll down. Maybe better not to scroll, but to move this center bar so that we can see all of our layers. Just click on that center bar and drag down. Now you see that we can see all of our layers. Now with my finger on the Shift key, Shift key is held down, I'm going to click on that last layer. I've Shift selected all of the last frames. We'll do a contextual menu, which is a right click on the PC, hold down the Control key, and click on the Mac. That way we can choose Copy frames. Copy frames it is. Now we're going to come over to the About scene and simply select in the first frame and choose Paste scene, Paste frames. Now notice we're going to get all the same layers, 
all of the same actions as well as the same buttons. And I'm running down and very quickly choosing right click and paste frames into all the scenes. Now we're going to get all of the properties throughout all of the scenes. All of our graphics are going to be in the same position. Ideal. Now I want to do is just identify these scenes. The last scene is called store. So instead of welcome, I'm going to type in store. And as you probably guess, in the email section, we're going to type in contact us. Contact us. And in the last section, which is about us, we will type in double clicking in the field about us. About us it is. Now we have one last step in this section, and that is to make sure that the background matches our beautiful design that we have created. And the way we're going to do that is not to put an image in the background behind the refrigerator on its own layer. We would like to just modify the movie properties. So under the movie modify pop down menu, we are going to choose movie to modify the movie. Notice we could set a frame rate. We're going to leave it to the default of 12. We could also set a movie dimensions. In this case, we're going to leave it as it is and just change the background color. This is actually a color swatch that has been selected by default, which is white. We are going to choose a peach color. So I am just going to go down a few, and we'll just select our peach color in the background. So there's the color that we want. It's going to be our peach color, and we're going to say OK. So now we've modified the background color of each one of our scenes by going under the Modify menu and choosing Modifying Scenes. Modify Movie, modifying the background color. Now what I want to do is to just fix this up one last step, and that is to take in each one of the scenes and slide over the correct piece of artwork in the background. So I don't want the refrigerator in the about us. I'd like to have the book, so I'm just holding down the Shift key so it only moves on the horizontal plane. Now we can see the book there. The last section, email, contact us. Let's put the phone up. Holding down the shift key, we're going to see the phone up there in the background. And we're going to go to the last section, which is the store, and we're going to bring the shopping bag into view. So let's just hold down the shift key and slide it across a little bit at a time until we get the shopping cart bag into view. Perfect. Now we've gone through this section, and we're ready to go one more step on to creating some great effects inside of Flash. Now that we have our site pretty much laid out the way we want it, the site's pretty much complete, let's go and add some special touches. We're going to do what's called shape tweening to add an effect to our main home page. Then we'll also make the logo move along a path by adding a motion guide. And the last thing we're going to do is add life to our site by simply dragging and dropping some sound into the main movie timeline to add sound to our final project. So let's get started on those three steps. The next step is to add a little pizzazz to our site. I'd like for these color bars to morph from basically being very small to grow across the screen. And the way we're going to do that is using shape tweening. So let's find our color bar layer. Here it is right here. Notice there's only a keyframe in frame one. Now if we want these color bars to change, we have to introduce a point of change. A point of change is known as a keyframe. So let's insert a new keyframe in frame 15. By this time, you probably know the shortcut key, which is F6 or you can just choose Insert Keyframe from the Insert drop-down menu. Now at this point, I have now four color bars in frame 15, as well as in frame 1. Now I want them to morph starting in frame 1. So what I'm going to do is select frame 1 as the keyframe that I want. Putting the playhead over frame 1, simply select color bar number 1, and then skip a color bar. Holding down the Shift key is going to allow me to have multiple object selected. So I'm going to hold down the shift key and click again. Now you notice I've got two bars selected. Now with the selection tool we're going to go down to the transform, turn on that transformation to do scaling, and I am going to scale these all the way down to the bottom of the screen. So let's go ahead and scale these down. We may need to scroll so we can see the very base of the screen. Just scroll that down just like so. So now we have two little boxes at the bottom. Now we're going to select the other two color bars. 
select them by holding down the shift key. Notice because we haven't turned on turned off scaling, it's still on. So let's pull down our screen. I'm using my grabber hand, just with the space bar, and scrolling up. So here we are scrolling up. Now at the very top of my screen, I have two little boxes as well. So if we look at these two keyframes, what you're going to see is in keyframe one, we have two little boxes. One at the bottom. Let's take a look at this. We have two at the bottom and two at the top. Now if we jump to keyframe 15, notice that's where we inserted the keyframe before we made the change. So these bars go all the way across the screen as they did in the beginning. Simply double click on keyframe one of the color bar layer. Double click and this time we're going to choose the tweening tab. Last time, motion tween. This time we're going to do a little shape tween. Shape tween, now that's selected, say OK. Notice the green line. The blue line across, that's motion tween. The green line, that is known as shape tween. So here we go. Look at our color bars grow over time. Hitting return will make that play through to our keyframe 15. And that's looking great. Now the next effect I'd like to show you is to have our logo follow what's known as a motion guide. So we have to create a motion guide. What I'm going to do is to select the logo layer. Now that that's selected, let's click on the little blue box underneath the logo. It's called Add a Guide Layer. So we'll click Add a Guide Layer. Now notice, here's our guide layer. And the indented layer indicates which layers we are guiding. This is the guide layer, this is the guided layer. Now on the guide layer, we're going to draw out a stroke. And I'm going to do that with my pencil tool choosing the smooth line mode. And I would like to do a stroke so that we can see it will be black. And I'm going to put a four point stroke will be good. And I'm going to simply draw a path from the center of my logo on the guide layer. I'm just going to draw right through the center and kind of bring it around just like so. Now notice, notice that my guide layer may be a little bit rough. So I can select it, shift select, double clicking is going to select the entire path. By double clicking we select the entire path and we can choose smooth so that becomes smoother. Now we can put our playhead back in frame one. Let's go back to frame one. Here's our logo. We need to grab from the center point. If it was on screen it would automatically go to the right point. In this case it's not and I'd like to just pull this out so we get the whole entire logo off screen doing that by just grabbing the end of the line and pulling out. Now if we hit play, let's see what happens. Notice the logo now follows that guided layer. I also notice that my logo runs underneath my buttons, which is not the way that I want it. So what I'm going to do is simply choose my button layer and drop that underneath of my logo layer, just shifting those layers down so logo now sits across the buttons and you'll see that the logo comes up perfect just like so. Now the thing that we don't like here is that the guide layer is being displayed. That will never be displayed when we go to export this to the web. But if we don't want to see it inside of the edit mode, all we need to do is turn off underneath of the eye, the little bullet that indicates that layer is being shown. We can turn it off. Even though it's been turned off so that we can't see it, you'll see that our logo still follows the layer, the motion guide layer. Now the trick here is to make sure that your center point has been dropped onto the line if it didn't already snap to there automatically. Let's go ahead and turn this off. We've created our motion guide and we've done motion tweening. The last thing that we want to do is to add sound to our site. And in this case we're going to borrow from that pre-existing flash file and just open it as a library. So I'm going to choose open as a library. What file do we want? We want that Mickey Live video, flash video file. And we have a few sounds in our library. The first one that we have is called Boogie. Now I'm going to go to Window and choose Library to open up our library. Notice that all the only items that we have in our library are graphic symbols as well as our buttons. And in this library we have the sounds. I'm going to add a new layer. Let's add a new layer to inside of our movie scene. I'm going to drag it up towards the top underneath actions. It's called layer 9. In this case we're going to double click on this layer to be able to name it. And we want to name it sound. 
Now the sound that we want to play is going to be called boogie. So we'll just simply drag and drop that sound anywhere onto the desktop, either from its name or the preview. And notice, once we release it, notice we now have a sound called boogie in our own library. Let's leave the other library up, leave our current file up at the same time. We'll have two libraries. One, of us, one, one is the one that we opened as our opened as a library, and this is our current movie library. Now if we hit play, we should be able to hear our sound. Now that we can see hear that sound, I would like to go and double click on the frame. Double click on frame in the sound layer. Now in the sound layer, what I want to do is to make this sound loop two times and then end. So we've chosen in the frame property the sound tab. How many times do we want it to loop? Just type in two and close the dialog box. Now when we hit play, this will loop twice. But before we find out how that works, let's do one more thing. And that's add sound to one of our buttons. We'll add sound to our home button. Double click on the button to open it. Put the playhead in the over state. Notice I have a rollover sound inside of that library. All we need to do is simply drag and drop it onto screen. You'll notice that the little wave file you can see actually in the over frame, it's that little blue line. Now in the down state, we're going to take the click sound and drag and drop it over into our home scene, into our home button. We're going to add that to our home button. Let's take a look at our home scene now. Go under control, make sure your buttons are enabled, and then come out onto screen. Home button is the first one. We roll over, you should see the, hear the over sound, and we click down, you should hear the click sound. Notice that those sounds are also now in our library. Speaking of our library, final touches here. Let's go ahead and clean our library up. We're going to add a folder to our library. Click on the folder button at the bottom of the library, and the folder that we want is going to be called sound. This is a good way to organize yourself. So now all we have to do is take those little sound files and drag and drop them into this folder. And now we know inside of our library where our sound files will be. Double clicking on the folder is going to close the folder so we don't see the file names. If we double click again, it opens the folder back up so we can see what's inside of it. Great, we've added some cool effect to our movie using shape tweening, add to a motion guide, as well as sound. Let's take a look at what we have. Just hit play by putting enter on the keyboard. So far we have a great looking site. We have an intuitive interface, we have great animation, and we've also added sound. Now what I'd like to do is help the site pay for itself. We're going to add a submit form so the customer can contact us, followed by an e-commerce application. And we're going to do all of this using editable text fields as well as some new actions that we haven't quite learned yet. But let's go ahead and learn those now. At this point we're going to start in the email scene. I also want to be sure that I have my text layer as the current layer. That's where the pencil is. Now I'm going to turn on my text tool. I'm also going to choose the font I want. I'm going to choose impact, the size I want, 18 points, and the color. In this case, I've chosen green. I want to make sure that the bold and italic are turned off, as well as I'm turning on the editable text box right down at the bottom. I'm going to turn that on. Now I'm going to simply draw across the screen right about here. And I'm going to type in email, and we'll say email address. So this is where the person will enter their email address. Now I'm going to draw out another text field right below it. We'll simply draw across the screen and down. And this will be our message field. So inside of this field, I'm going to type the word message. The next step is to do a little right clicking. With the arrow tool, Inside the message field, I'm going to click with the right mouse button holding down the control key on the Mac or right clicking on the PC, and I will choose properties. I need to name this field so when the email comes back to me, it will say the message field equals. So we'll say message 
name that the message field. Now I want to leave the background and border there. I'm not going to restrict the length and I want it to be editable, but what I want to do is to include the font outline. I want the person to be able to type in the same style which I have created. So I've included the font set. It's not going to rely on the system with that selected. I'm going to say OK. Now we'll take a look at the email address and all we really need to do is to name this email. So when our email comes back to it, we'll say email equals and whatever the person types in that field in the font that we've selected, that's what will be returned to us. We have our field set up. Now we need to create a submit button. Going under window, choose library. We're going to use the same trick we used earlier and that was just to select one of our buttons. I'm going to select one of our buttons and choose duplicate. Once I have the button duplicated, we'll make sure it's defined as a button and now we will also type in the name submit. And let's go ahead and say OK. Now we have our button named, we need to edit it. So I'm double clicking on the button to go into symbol edit mode. We're in symbol edit mode, the overstate turn store, that was the one that we copied, into submit and we need to do that in the down state as well. So we'll type in submit. Now we have our submit button created. What I want to do is drag it out on screen and I want it to be inside of the button layer. So I'm going to select the button layer to make that the current layer. Make sure I have nothing selected. So I'm going to use the arrow tool and click away. Now we'll take our new button which is called submit and drag it out onto screen. So have the submit button on screen. It's a little large. Actually, we'd like these buttons to be a little bit smaller than my main navigational button. So I'm going to go under Modify, Transform, and I'm going to choose Scale and Rotate. This will allow me to type in a percentage that I want to scale it to. And I would like to scale this to, uh, I'm going to say 40%. I want it to be relatively small. So here we have it, 40%. You can type in even a smaller number if you like. So I have my Submit button. Now we need to apply the action. We're going to apply the action to submit this or email this form back to us. So we choose the action tab, choose the plus sign. How are we going to have this emailed to us? And we're going to do that through get URL. First of all, notice the variable setting has been set to don't send. In this case, we'd like to use send using post. All we need to do to have this form mailed to us is type in our email address. So that you know what to type, I'm going to type in your email, don't put any spaces, we'll say email address. And then we'll say at, we'll type in your domain.com. Be sure that you don't put any spaces in, just type in your email address put at and then your domain and you will receive that in your email when the person clicks the submit button. And I'm going to say OK at this point. That's how we would do a mail to. Let's also make sure our button works. So I'm going to go under control, choose enable button. We're going to hear our button sounds. We roll over the button that we added sound to as well as see the submit button that works. Now we're going to move on to the store scene. We're going to create ourselves a little e-commerce application, an order form. The way this works is to go ahead and draw out the order form on screen. I want to make sure that I'm on my text layer once again, so I'm going to select that layer to make my pencil move to that line. I'll now click away to make sure nothing is selected on the screen. Let's do a little drawing. So I'm going to do a little drawing. I'm going to choose a stroke. I would like to draw a box with a white stroke. Set that to be four points. And I'd also like to use my transparent white background. Before we get too far, it might be helpful for us to disable the button so every time we roll over the button, we don't see the overstate. I'm going to go ahead and draw my box out on screen. Here's going to be my order form, kind of like so. So I have my order form, transparent in the background. Also going to draw some white strokes out. Here's my first white stroke, and we'll just drag that out on screen. I'm going to do a little option drag. Select the line and then drag it down across screen. And I'll drag a few vertical bars as well. I'm going to drag one right about here. This is looking good. And I'm going to draw the next one down like so. 
again. Now notice right up here I have a problem. I've drawn the line and extended it above my box. But remember, whatever you can see, that is an object. So I can just select that portion and then hit the delete key. I also take this line and we can take these lines and nudge them down. I'm going to hold down the shift key. I'd like this box to grow a little bit, so we're going to just nudge that line down. In the top, we're going to call this our product section. So I'm going to choose 12 point, 14 point impact, and we're going to choose black as our color, and we're going to type it into the field. Turning off bold and italic. My text field, first one is going to be called product. So we'll call this product. Now that we have this in the field, we can go ahead and align it the way that we want it. Now I'm going to option drag this field over so I don't have to reset the font. Now that I've got a copy, we'll just nudge it into place. Now in this field, I'd like it to be center. So I'm going to first type in characters which I want, which are Q, T, Y for quantity. I'd also like it to be center in the field, so I'm going to grow the text box and then choose align and center. I've got that align center. The next one over, as you guess, is price. We have to enter the price. So we'll type in price. Now that we have price set up, let's establish a few products. So I'm going to go ahead and type in, we'll say 18 points. We'll increase, increase the text size of our new text field. So I'm going to choose 18 points. And then I'm going to click start typing right in this area. So our first product is going to be called the hat set. That's our hat magnet set. The next set we're going to call, put a couple returns in there, we'll call this the faces set. So we have the faces set as well as the hat set. Don't really want these center, so I'm going to turn on a line left, and I'm also going to increase the size of my text field so I can get that without wrapping. Select the text, and let's just nudge it. And I'm going to use the arrow keys just to nudge that into place. Now we need to enter the quantity and the price. So let's go ahead and put in another text field right here. So here's my next text field. This is going to be the quantity. And I'm going to simply put in a 0. We need to start out with a 0 quantity, and I would like that to be center as well. Now this is going to be an editable text field. Notice the little square is at the top. That indicates it's not editable at this point, so I need to turn that on. Notice the little square moves to the bottom. That means that that is an editable text field. Now I'm going to simply option drag, so I got a copy of it, right across. And I'm going to do the same. Select both of them holding down the shift key, and then option drag on the Mac, alt drag on the PC to get a second copy, and we'll put in a price. So our first section is going to be this field, and I'm going to choose a price of, we'll say, 393 is the price. 393 is the price for the first one. And the face is set, well, that's going to cost 697. 697 it is. Now we need to create these text fields. So first of all, we need to right click and choose the properties. I don't want the background, and I need to name this field, and for short, so I know this is the hat quantity, I'm going to put hat Q for quantity. I'm also going to restrict the number of characters. I'll turn that on. This will mean that the person can only order up to 99. We'll say the length that we can have in this field, the person can type, is two characters. We'd also like to include the font set, but I don't want to include the entire thing. I only want to include numbers at this point. And let's say OK. So I'm going to need to do the same to the lower text field. But in this case, we need to set the field variable name to be faces, Q for quantity, turn off the background, restrict the length to be two characters, and include only the numbers. We're only going to include the numbers on the outline of the font and say OK. Now this is a little bit different. We're coming over to price, and we're going to the properties. And then here, we'll call this hat and then P for price. I don't want the border. I'm not going to restrict the number of characters, but I am going to turn off editability. I don't want the person to be able to edit this text field. I'd like to be able to edit this from an outside source if I want. So I'm going to turn off, disable editing, and disable selection. I'm going to include the 
the outline of the numbers, but because I have the punctuation in there, I can include the entire set of punctuation, but because it's only a period, I'm going to also include a set of characters. And the character I want in this case is just a period. And we're going to say OK. That's hat price. Now we're going to right click, choose the properties of our text field called faces. Faces, and we'll put a P for price. Once again, we're disabling the background. We're disabling editing and selection, including only a specific set of the font, which is the numbers, as well as one character, which is going to be the period. So now we have our text field set up. Now let's go ahead and add the grand total. Let's take our price. We're going to put in a price field, and we'll just type it in right here. Our total, we'll call this grand total. Grand total it is. And I'll also put a dollar sign in this field. So now I have the grand total set up. Now I just need to put a text field in. So my grand total field, and we need to put in a new text field. So I'm going to select my text box, and I'm going to go ahead and define this area out here as where the total will be. And I'm going to type in a 0. Now I want the 0 not to be center. I would like that to justify to the right so that it flows out to the outside. So let's go ahead and select this text field. I also noticed that my grand total is an editable text field, and I don't really want that, so I'm going to turn that off. Notice the box moves to the top. Now when we select this text field, the box is down the bottom because it's an editable text field, and we're going to choose properties. And we're going to call this field total. I'm going to disable editing. We're going to have these price fields equal our total, but I'm going to include the font set of the numbers as well as the character punctuation of the period and say OK. Now here comes the fun part. We have to make an action that will add the quantity times the price of hats plus the quantity times the price of faces that will equal our total. So we're going to create a new button going to Window, choose Library. In the Library, we're going to copy the Submit button. So we'll choose Duplicate. And we're going to choose this to be our Total. Total button it is. Once again, we're doing the same thing, double-clicking on the button and typing in the word Total into the Over state, as well as Total into the Down state. Total it is go back to the store timeline, get out of symbol edit mode. Now I'm going to take that total button and bring it onto screen. So here's my total button. Remember we can go under modify, transform, scale and rotate to get that 40% size. Just type in a numerical value. In this case we're going to stick with 40 and bring that up onto the screen. So here's my little button. In this case, put it right up here like so. This will be the total button up on this side of the screen. So we need to apply an action to this button. So we'll double click on the button. And we're going to take a preview trip of the Expressions Editor. We're going to click on the plus sign and choose Set Variable. Set Variable is the action that we're going to create. Well, what is the variable we want to set? Well, we'd like to set the total field. So we type in the word total. Well, what's the value of total? Well, we're going to use Expressions Editor to get there. So we choose Expressions Editor and we'll turn on expressions. We'd like to do a little multiplying, right? We have to multiply. We'll have to multiply the field that we've called hat quantity for Q. And we're going to multiply that. We'll say times. So we'll double click on the word times. Multiply that times hat price. And we have to do plus. We're going to add faces and we'll say times and that's faces quantity so we want to put a Q in there for quantity times faces price and I'm going to say OK so what we see is the value is hat quantity times the hat price plus the faces quantity times the faces price equals our total now the only way for us to test this button is to go out to test movie mode.
In this case, really, I don't want to test the entire movie. I just like to test a scene. So we're going to test a scene, and this will work as well. So we choose Test Scene. So let's take a look at what happens. We're going to type in the field. And I want to order two of the faces set. And we'll say one of the two of the hats, one of the faces. And we click on the Total button. And look at what happens. We've now multiplied this field and this field. And that now equals our total. Pretty slick. What happens if we want to reset these fields back to 0? Let's go ahead and create that now. We're going to go back to our main movie. And we're going to duplicate our, sub our total button. We'll just duplicate. We've done this throughout this project. We'll choose Duplicate. And we're going to name this Reset. Reset is the button that we want to create. We'll edit it. Look at all the buttons we have in our library. We're going to choose to name this Reset. Reset it is and reset in the down state. I'll just copy that and we'll go over to the down state and just paste that in. Now we'll go back to our main movie timeline and bring in the reset button. Once again it's large. We're going to go under modify, transform, scale and rotate and set that to 40 and we'll just bring this up on screen. So I'm going to choose the arrow tool and nudge this just right alongside with the second first button. Now we have to apply a new action, which is double click on the button to choose the action tab. Click the plus. We're going to set the variable. Well, what do we want to set the variable to? We'd like to set the variable of total equal to 0. So we'll type in 0. We'd also like to add another set variable. So we'll choose the plus sign and choose set variable. We want to set the the value of set the value of hat q for quantity equal to 0 and we wanted to set the value of faces quantity that's the q equal to 0 0 as well now all we need to do is say okay now if we go back to test scene mode let's go back and test this scene we can type in a price, so we'll say 2 and 1, and say total. That's going to hit 1483, and then if we set reset, you'll see now those numbers in the form have been set to 0. We have one last step, and that is to create a button that will submit this. And the way to submit this is using a CGI script, and I'll show you how to set that up. At this point, we're going to go ahead and reuse the submit button. So we're going to take our submit button. And we don't have a lot of room. So you may want to make this look a little bit nicer on your own. But I'm just going to drag the submit button out of the library onto screen. And I'm going to use scale, transform, scale and rotate using 40 as a percentage again and saying OK. So this is going to be my submit button over here on this side. With this set up, all I need to do is to simply double click on the button, choose the plus sign, get URL. At this point, we're also going to set the variable to post. And you can use any pre-existing CGI script and paste it into this URL window. And at that point, you would be able to submit your order form to your database or to your e-commerce back-end solution. CGI scripts are beyond the scope of this video, but it is important to know that Flash supports CGI scripts so that you can communicate with your server to create dynamic applications. The last step in this project is to export our file out to be posted to the web. And let's go ahead and do that now. Now that we've done all this great stuff, let's go ahead and publish it to the web. Under the File menu, I am going to choose the Publish setting. doesn't get any easier than this. All we need to do is choose the file formats we want to export. In this case, we can export SWF as well as HTML. Also notice we can export as GIF, PNG, JPEG, as well as standalone executable files that may be great for creating Flash presentations. Notice down here, great new feature, which would be support of QuickTime. Inside of QuickTime, we can support Flash objects. So 
So now I'm going to come under the Flash tab. We can choose Protect from Import, and also we can take our MP3 file, which would be streaming. We're going to export all our sound as MP3. We can set a bit rate. If I choose 56K, our, files will, our sound files will only be 7.9% of their original size. I can also choose the HTML tab. A couple options here. Notice that I can do Flash forward with Image. This would create code that would do browser detection. But in my case, I'm going to choose Flash only because over 83% have the player already. Now what I'm going to do is choose my movie size. I don't want it to be to match my movie size in pixels. I'd like it to be a percentage. I want it to be 100% of the browser window. So it sets 100% by default. Now all I have to do is hit Publish. Say Publish. It's going to save my HTML file as well as my SWF file to wherever I have saved my document. And in my case, that's out on the desktop. So let's hide Flash. And I'm going to double click on the HTML page that was just selected. Here we are inside the browser. This is our great looking site. We have our rollover buttons. We can scroll through here. That's our email page, as well as our form. We can type in how many of the hat set, how many of the faces set we want. Do total, as well as reset that form to zero. It's 100% of the browser window. So as I scale this down, you see it fills the browser window 100%, even if it's really small, because it's vector-based, resolution independent, and anti-aliases in real time. This is a great looking site. Next, we're going to go beyond the basics. So stay with me. If you've gotten this far, you're definitely ready for a few of my favorite advanced techniques. We're going to learn how to work with a movie clip. Then we'll learn how to work with an alpha channel. We'll create an animated button followed by doing a tell target inside of a layer mask. So if you're ready, let's go beyond the basics. From the file menu, we're going to choose a file that I've already created that's up on our website called Beyond the Basics. We'll choose Open, Beyond the Basics. Now all I've created is a little controller. This controller was created using a similar technique as we created the nav bar in our previous project. I've also created a few symbols in my library. I have a button, which is just the plus sign all by itself, and also a button, which is the minus sign all by itself, as well as the kitchen, and a new arrow that I simply created. Now what I'm going to do is to create a new symbol by clicking on the plus sign. We're going to call this symbol, call this arrow movie. And we're going to define it as a movie clip. Now we're working in symbol edit mode on the arrow movie. All I want to do is to pull my arrow out on screen. So we'll pull our arrow out on screen. Now in frame 10, I'm going to insert a keyframe. A keyframe being a point of change, shortcut key for that is F6. Now we're going to move the arrow across the screen, holding down the shift key. Now that I have the arrow moved across screen, I'm going to double click on the arrow. This opens the instance property dialog box. I'm choosing the color effect tab. From the list, I'm going to choose Alpha Channel. Notice, when I set the Alpha Channel to zero, inside a preview window, the arrow disappears. But when I say OK, you'll see that the bounding box for the arrow is still on the screen. In frame 1, arrow is at 100%. And in frame 10, the Alpha value has been set to zero, so the arrow disappears. Still there. All we need to do is double click on the frame in frame 1 and now choose Motion Tweening. What we're going to create is a fade out effect over time. Now I'm going to go ahead and say OK. Notice there's our blue line, which indicates we have tweened between two keyframes. Now as you see here, when I hit play, the arrow now fades out. One of the benefits of a movie clip is that a movie clip can continue to play on a stop frame. In our current movie, we only have one frame showing. So what I'm going to do is drag out my movie my arrow movie onto screen. It's relatively small. We'll just zoom in on this area. And now for a movie clip to work, we must go to test movie mode or test scene. If we don't, we always only see the first frame of a movie clip. So I'm going to go to test movie. Now you can see that my arrow is fading out over time. 
Notice also that it continues to play. It will automatically loop unless we put an action on the timeline of the movie clip that tells it to stop. And at this point, all I want to show you is that the movie clip will automatically loop back and forth and that it fades out over time. The next step is for us to zoom back out again. And I want to delete this arrow. I want to show you how to create an animated button. So I'm going to open my plus sign. With my plus sign open, I'm going to add a new layer to this button. So we'll click on the plus sign on the layer, and I'd like it to be below my plus layer. So I'll double click on the layer, and I'm just going to call this the movie layer, because that's where we're going to put our movie clip. I don't want to apply it in the overstate, in the upstate. I want to apply it in the overstate. So I'm going to hit F7 to insert a blank keyframe. And inside of that keyframe, I'm going to drag out my arrow movie. And I'm going to align it nice and neat right next to my plus sign. So what's going to happen is, because a movie clip continues to play on a stop frame, when we roll over our plus button, it'll automatically animate. Let's go ahead and check this out. I'm going to go back to my scene one, and I'm going to drag my plus button onto scene. Now that I have my plus button on the screen, remember, if I turn on the button and say enable, all I'm ever going to see of the button is going to be the first state of the movie clip. We must go to test movie mode for this button to become an animated button. So let's go ahead and test this out. We'll say test movie. We roll over our button, and you see now the animation takes effect, just like so. We've created an animated button. This would be the basis if you wanted to do a pop-out menu. That's through putting a movie clip into the overstate. Now we're going to go back and fix up our minus key, our minus button. Double click to edit the button. We're going to do the same thing once again and simply add a layer. We'll call this our movie layer. Put a blank keyframe into the overstate so that we can put out our animated arrow movie. Now in this state, Obviously, it's going to be pointing the wrong direction, so I'm simply going to flip it around. So I'm going to choose Rotate, and I'm going to rotate, rotate it all the way around 180 degrees and simply put it on this side of the minus button. Going back to the main scene, I'm going to take and put my minus button out onto screen. So we have the up state. The minus and the plus scene, we're seeing the upstate and the overstate. Now all I'm going to do is to simply turn control, enable buttons off, and align these together, kind of in the center of my little controller window. Now that looks pretty good. What we're going to do now is we're going to use the two buttons that we put on screen to control a movie clip. So for now, let's just leave them exactly where they're at. We're going to go to our library and create a new symbol. We're going to call this a movie clip as well. And in this case, we'll just name it Straight Movie. And inside of this symbol that we're creating, we're going to drag out the kitchen onto screen. And I'm just going to position it kind of in the center of the screen. So I have this center. Now, we're going to go to frame 15. And in frame 15, we're going to insert a keyframe because we're going to animate this to scroll across the screen. So we're going to say, insert keyframe, hit F6. Now, slide the kitchen across the screen. Now that the kitchen is across the screen, double click on the frame to indicate that we are going to choose to add a little tweening, motion tweening, and say OK. Now as we scrub the playhead, you should see your kitchen move across the screen in time. Now another benefit of a movie clip is that you can have an action applied to the frame of the movie clip and the playhead will respect it. And in this case, we want to tell the playhead to stop. So we double click on the frame to choose the frame properties dialog box and choose the plus sign to tell the movie to stop playing. We want it to be controlled by our plus and minus sign. So we have our movie clip created. Now we're going back to the main scene. And in this scene, first thing we're going to do is to add a new layer. Add a new layer. We'll call this the movie layer. The movie layer it is. 
Now that we have our movie created, let's just drag it out onto screen. I've added a new, new layer called movie, so let's just drag that out onto screen. In order for us to tell this movie exactly what to do, we must first name it. So let's do a little naming. I'm going to double click to launch Instance Properties dialog box. Under definition, you'll notice the instance name. Well, what do we want to name it? We might as well name it movie. We'll call it movie and then say OK. Now the next step is to tell our buttons to tell movie clip what to do. So double click on the button and choose the actions tab. Choose the plus sign and this is a little bit tricky. Normally it should be tell movie clip but in this case what we're going to find is it is called tell target. That's how we tell a movie clip what to do. Well we've only named one movie clip and that's the only one we can tell to do. So all we need to do is double click on the word movie. Now with this selected, we can now tell the movie that we'd like it to go to a certain place. And I'm going to tell, tell the movie clip to go to, we're going to say the previous frame and say OK. Now on the plus button, we're going to choose to do the same thing. We're going to choose tell target. What do we want? To, which target? We want the movie target. We're also going to tell it to go to, but in this case, we don't want the previous frame. We want the next frame. In order for our movie clips to work, we must go to Control, Test Movie Mode. So we're going to test our movie out. We click on the plus sign, and you should see that our kitchen now moves across the screen. Clicking on the minus sign, those are our animated buttons, you'll see that the kitchen moves back across the screen. The further we click, the further it moves, the minus, the further it moves back. Now this is, we're one step away from completing our project. Let's go back to our main movie project. What I want to do is create a movie, a layer mask, so that the kitchen will be hidden inside of the background in our controller. So I'm going to click on the plus button. So we're going to say, click on movie layer, click on the plus button, and this layer, I'm going to call it mask. So I'm going to call this mask. Say OK. Now I'm going to select the white background of the controller. You can see it's selected because that is going to be the checkerboard pattern inside the background. And I'm going to choose copy. Now I'm going to go to frame one of the mask layer and choose edit, paste in place. So it's in the exact same position. Now you see it's exactly over top of my movie clip. Now we have to make it a mask. Double click on the little page icon next to the mask layer. This will open what's known as a layer properties. The type of layer we want is not a normal layer, it will be a mask layer. And I'm going to say OK. Now you notice the icon next to the word mask inside of my mask layer has turned to a down arrow. It's asking me to select a layer that we are going to mask out. And that is going to be my movie layer. To turn that on, all I need to do is hold down on the Option key on the Mac, Alt key on the PC, and click on that movie layer. You'll see now that it's indented with a purple circled arrow. But you see my mask still isn't working. In order for my mask to work, my layers must be locked. So I'm going to choose my mask layer and lock it. Choose my movie layer and lock that down. Now you see my kitchen is inside of this mask. Now let's go to test movie mode. So I'm going under control, test movie. Here's my plus sign. We're going to move this, move this across inside the mask and back. What can we do with this? We could have this control our entire site if we wanted to. But at this point, we've simply gone beyond the basics. Hopefully you've enjoyed this training program. As you can see, Flash is the only solution for producing high-impact vector-based websites. And now you're well on your way to creating your own. Good luck, and come back and see us at macromedia.com.